But let me pray first as we um, prepare ourselves before the Lord for what is that he would like to say to us this morning through his word. So Father, we just continue to want to be mindful and paying attention to you this morning. Lord, our focus has been upon you as we've worshipped you. And Lord, are we are forever grateful that we serve a God who speaks to us, communicates to us, and also hears us. And so, Lord, this morning, as we come to your word, we do, do so um, humbly, uh, with an awareness, God, that you are God and we are not, uh, but with um, a sense of gratefulness, Lord, that you have something to say to each one of us this morning, that each one of us can come to your word with an expectancy, God, that you are able to transform and change us. And so, Lord, would you have your way with us this morning? And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So most of you would know by now that we are in a slightly different sermon series to usual. Most of the time when we're doing a sermon series, we pick a book and then um, of the Bible and then we work our way through it. And uh, this um, series is actually much more of a thematic se series and we've titled it Wholehearted. And I guess... Um, reiterating again some of the things that Adam and Andrew have spoken about in the last few weeks, our, our heart behind doing a series like this is to be intentional in a discipling and even pastoral way to address the reality that for each of us there are many things that contend for our loyalty and our devotion to Jesus. There are things that impact our wholehearted love for him. Or to use the phrase used in the book of Revelations in the letter written to the, um, the church at Ephesus, there are things that cause us at times to abandon our first love. And that was where Andrew started us in that, this series this knowledge that this was this church in all sorts of other ways was vibrant and serving the Lord in amazing ways and good ways. And yet there had been this dulling of their devotion and their wholehearted love towards Jesus. And so whether we have been a Christian and we would measure that in days or whether we've been a Christian and we would measure it in decades... It is always worth us making time together to take an honest inventory of our lives of faith in order to rekindle our devotion, understanding that none of us are immune to the dulling of our devotion and our first love towards Jesus. And so our desire in this season and this series is that we would again be rekindling our devotion to Jesus and further becoming a wholehearted people. So Adam and Andrew have addressed a number of themes so far. They've um, talked about moving from distraction to devotion, from grumbling to gratitude, and then last week from being passive to being passionate in prayer. And I don't know about anyone else, but I found myself the whole of the rest of this week thinking, do I say it is what it is? Is that something that I say a lot? Um, I don't know about the rest of you, but I've just, just made me pay attention to these kind of automatic phrases that we pick up that swirl around us. I certainly heard it said quite a lot on things like media reports. So, um, Anyway, you might have noticed, though, that um, in this series, there's a little bit of a pattern about how the sermons have been titled. Well, full disclosure, I, I found it impossible to title this sermon this morning with words that were the, started with the same letter. And so, um, with Adam and Andrew not here, I've decided to be rebellious and completely buck the trend. 
And so my message is titled, Closed to Open Hearted. If you can come up with words that mean that by the end of the sermon that rhyme or start with the same letter, let me know. But today what I want to look at in all seriousness is an area of our lives that I would venture to say is up there as one of the most significant indicators of how we are tracking in living in wholehearted devotion to Jesus. And I know that's a big call. But it's the area of our relationships with one another. It is a crucial part of our normal Christian life and the way of living and following Jesus and in wholehearted devotion. It is a crucial part of our life to consider how we live with one another, how we consider one another, how we love one another. We are to live with our hearts wide open, not only to God, but towards each other. And I would go as far as to say right up front this morning that we can't live in wholehearted devotion to God and not live with affection for his people, for his church, for his family, for our family. We are called, in fact, we are commanded by Jesus to love one another. So today where we're heading in scripture is to look at part of Paul's second letter to the church in Corinth. So we call that 2 Corinthians. And if you're wanting to sort of turn there and get ready, um, we're going to be reading some passages in chapter 2 and then also in chapter 6. But while you're finding your place, I just wanted to give you a little bit of background to what's going on here um, around this letter. I think that um, we often, as modern-day Western Christians think that there's been no other time in history that the church has lived with so much external pressure and competing cultural narratives that contend for our loyalty as believers in Christ as now. And whilst, of course, the bombardment of the... um, constant global instant news cycle and digital media has dialed up a notch our awareness of what is all around us. It's simply not true to say that the times we are living in are harder than any other time in Christendom. The city of Corinth is a case in point. Now, the city of Corinth was a wealthy, busy, cosmopolitan city. Its location meant that people came far and wide to that area because it had a port and um, was very connected to different parts of the continent. And it was a city that really valued self-promotion and success. It was a very culturally diverse population of people and had Greek, Roman and indeed even Oriental influences. And they also had a very large transient population of sailors, merchants and business people who came in to the city on a regular basis, but not only for work, but also to sample the nightlife. Because, as you may well know, Corinth was known as a place of rampant sexual immorality. You also find in Corinth as a city that with both Greek and Roman influences, there were numerous temples to other gods. There was a vast array of um, worship and pagan practices that were not only for those people who went to the temples to worship, but actually was woven through the whole of everyday life for the people who lived there. A lot of their community and social gatherings were focused around the temple. Um, You'll notice if you've read 2 Corinthians that there's a lot of discussion around things like eating meat that's been sacrificed to idols. That's because there was a practice of sacrificing meat to idols in the various temples around. But then that meat would be served at one of the social gatherings and you'd have no idea 
And so this, these practices were just woven through everything. And even if as a Christian you were looking to try and set yourself apart a bit, it was very hard to avoid. In a nutshell, the culture of Corinth was one that promoted prosperity and pleasure. And then you have the Corinthian church that's been planted, planted in amongst this. I think it's important for us to remember it's, it was a fairly new church. Um, when Paul was writing this second letter to them, it was only five years after he had been there to originally preach the gospel to them. And the church was made up of some Jews... But actually, the, in Maine, the church was made up of Gentiles. And so what we see when we read um, the, the, the letter to the Corinthians is this church that's struggling and frequently failing to live in the way of Jesus rather than in the way of the pagan culture that surrounded them. And I don't know about you, but I find that in some ways comforting. God doesn't cut those things out of scripture. He doesn't just kind of give us the highlights and the high points. He shows us what it looks like to wrestle and struggle in our faith in the midst of a culture that is bombarding us. The other thing that's really important to note for us, particularly with the theme that we're looking at today, is that relationally speaking, at the time that the book, um, the, this book, the Second Corinthians, the letter was written, the Corinthian church had a lot of issues with the Apostle Paul. You may think that cancel culture is a new thing, but it is not. He would have been struck off Facebook. They'd have been talking about him on forums. They were not sure that they liked his gospel anymore. He just didn't seem that impress impressive or prosperous or pleasant as the messages that they were starting to hear from false prophets that had infiltrated the church. And what was more painful is that they actually didn't really like Paul. To them, he was full of weakness, his speech was unimpressive, and there was a scandal in their minds that he had suffered, that he had been beaten, that he'd been mocked, stoned, and afflicted. Somehow, this undermined his credibility in their eyes as God's divine messenger. They were expecting him to be more successful, more charismatic, to be a strong leader that they could respect. And then on top of that, he told them things that they didn't want to hear. He challenged them. He sent hard letters to them. And so by this point of writing this letter, there is a lot of water under the bridge. There are a lot of issues and baggage in their relationships together. You could say that their hearts were closed to Paul. So it was in this context, with Paul knowing full well what they thought about him, that he wrote this letter to them. Early in his letter, so this is chapter 2, he writes this, For I wrote to you out of much affliction and anguish of heart and with many tears, not to cause you pain, but to let you know the abundant love I have for you. And then if we pick up further on in his letter, chapter 6 for us, he probably didn't put chapters in his letter. Verse 11, he writes this. We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted in your own affections. In return, I speak as to children, widen your hearts also. These are people who have hurt Paul. They've caused him anguish, affliction and pain. He actually describes some of their treatment towards him in verses, you'll find this in verses 8 to 10 of chapter 6. They've slandered him, they've dishonoured him, they've treated him as an imposter and as a stranger. Later in this letter, he actually ranks his daily, the daily pressure of his anxiety over the church up there with being shipwrecked, 
in being in physical danger and in starvation. Like that's how much it, it cut him. He, he wasn't a superhero without real emotions. He was a human being. And it's evident that the things that they had said about him had cut him deeply, especially given the amount of time that he'd invested with them. You know, there are letters that he writes to churches that he hasn't hung out with them. He's just as an apostle writing to them. He had spent time with the Corinthian church. I think that a natural response would have been just to blow them off, close his heart and move on. And yet, instead, he confessed to them his full affection and asked them again for their affection in return. He called them children, which I don't want us to misunderstand. For us in our culture, we might think that he's talking down to them or belittling them, but that's not what he's doing. He's using a term of endearment, one of fathering and discipleship. And so he was leading by example with his own heart open, even in the midst of their closed ones. He repeats himself again later in the letter. In chapter 7, he says, excuse me, make room in your hearts for us. We have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. We have taken advantage of no one. I do not say this to condemn you, For I've said before that you are in our hearts. This to me seems nothing short of superhuman and in fact probably more accurately supernatural. Because I am quite sure that I don't need to tell any of you that relationships in our lives as human beings are going to be both the source of our greatest joys and our most painful moments. It isn't a secret, is it, that living life together well and keeping our relationships intact is hard. It's hard in families, it's hard in workplaces and schools, and it's hard as a community of believers. It's hard wherever there are other human beings. And so it's all too easy for our hearts to become close to one another. We have all been hurt and disappointed in relationships and carry pain. And the reality for each of us is that when we get hurt, most of us become self-protective and close off our hearts. When I was thinking about what some of the things are that cause us to close our hearts, and I'm sure that you could think of many more, I was thinking about kind of the disconnection and the isolation that the era we live in inflicts upon us and particularly the effects of the pandemic and what that has done and caused in us to close off our hearts, even if that's simply because we've kind of got out of practice of living together. I don't know if you've ever had a circumstance in your life, I certainly have, of people who I haven't seen for a while and then something kind of comes up and because I haven't seen them for a while so my heart's not connected to them, I start imagining them to be something that they're not and then I start running a narrative in my head thinking things about them and all of a sudden I've built up feelings and closed my heart off to them simply because of my imaginings and because I haven't seen them. You know, there are things that we would say face to face when we're in relationship with one another that when we're isolated and disconnected or we use social media that we, we lose all the nuances and, the, and, and we, we end up hurting one another. And then when you add to that the fact that when we are consumed by anxiety and, again, I mean, all of the worldly statistics at least anyway say that we are living with more anxiety than, than we ever have done before. And so when we're consumed by anxiety, we are way much, much less likely to be open-hearted. We become much more insular when we're anxious. And so with that and the disconnect and the social isolation, you end up with this perfect cocktail for relational tensions and disunity. When we live with closed hearts, what we end up doing is assuming the worst of each other. 
we, we are quick to get angry and to be offended. We're, we tend to be less reasonable, more quarrelsome and contentious, divisive and nitpicking. When we live with a closed heart, we live restricted. And that's the word that Paul used to describe the state of the Corinthians' heart. He says that they are restricted in their affections. And that word restricted means a narrow and cramped place. It's a good description, I think. When we live with our hearts closed to each other, we live in a narrow, cramped, bound-up place. And Paul was not immune to this. He's got a well-documented relationship breakdown with his mentor Barnabas. Like We know that he didn't live this out perfectly. He understood and lived with the challenges that we live with about being part of a community of believers where we have diverse backgrounds and experiences, where there may be areas of division and differences of opinion that are swirling around us that in some ways at a natural level we're a group of people who've only been brought together because of our shared relationship with Jesus. And then in the midst of that, we're asked to try and live out this command to love one another. And so it's hardly surprising because that was Paul's experience too and the early church's experience that in his apostolic letters he regularly addressed relationships and relationship tensions. In his letter to the church at Philippi, if you want to read this or catch up on it later, it's Philippians 2 verses 1 to 4. It says this, So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. In other words, to use our terminology for this morning, live with your hearts wide open. And Paul wasn't writing this, as we already know, from a theoretical perspective, but from hard-won, lived experience and with an open demonstration in his own life of what this looks like. And so this morning, as we finish our time together, what I want to do is explore the application of this. It's great to talk about the theory of it, but what does that look like in our life? And how do we take inventory in our own life for this? How do we live more open-heartedly. But as I was preparing for um, this sermon, there were just two tensions that kept coming up for me. And pastorally, I do just want to address them just so that it's clear what the context for this is in our life. So the first tension for me when we're talking about living with our hearts wide open to others is that this doesn't mean that we don't have discernment in our close relationships and our influential associations. We have to be careful that relationships in our life are not detrimental to our devotion to Jesus. And in fact, if you read on in chapter 6 of his letter to the Corinthians, verse 14, Paul actually addresses this. Um, In this passage, he uses the terminology unequally yoked, or that's our translation, and that's often presented only in the context of marriage, or that's certainly been my experience in the past, but we need to remember that Paul, what's the context that Paul's writing to the church in Corinth about? And what we, what we know is that they were surrounded by this pagan culture that was pressing on, in, on them from the outside, And we also know that from the inside they'd begun embracing a false teaching and doctrine that was leading to them closing off their heart to the gospel and to Paul. And so the thing that I want us to remember, the tension I want us to remember as we talk about living wide open with our hearts to one another is that an open heart is still a discerning one. And then the second tension, because when we gather, whether it's here in the building or online, 
is I want to make it abundantly clear that I am assuming when we're talking about some of these things in practice in our life, that this is in healthy and safe relationships, even if they're a bit mucky and human and have some conflict. What we're exploring today does not at any time apply to abusive or controlling relationships. So with those tensions in mind, I just pastorally just didn't want to gloss over them. How would you rate your open-heartedness? For those of you with kids, you may have got school reports this week. And uh, one of my daughters got her school report. And of all the commendable achievements in her report, there was this one phrase that made me most proud as a mum. Her teacher wrote, she is generously affectionate with her friends. And I was writing this sermon at the time and I thought, in other words, she's living with her heart wide open. I wondered what my report card would say when it comes to being open hearted. What would your report card say? As always, when our attention is drawn to something, we end up seeing it more easily, don't we? So the, the week that Adam spoke about grumbling to gratitude, I kept finding myself all week tripping over grumblings waiting to happen. Um, and this week, what I found as I've been thinking about what's my report card say, I've, I've found many times where I've thought to myself, oh, that was really not very open-hearted of you, Catherine. And I really don't want to be restricted in my affections, to use Paul's terminology. I want to be generously affectionate. But regardless this morning of what you think your report card might say, what I want to encourage each of us today in is that it is possible to move and grow from closed to open-hearted to widen our hearts, just as Paul asked his readers to do. And so as we finish this morning, I just want to give us three keys to improving our open-hearted report card. Number one, being open-hearted towards one another is not an optional extra as wholehearted followers of Jesus. It's not for the extrovert. It's not for those who are just more mercifully and compassionately minded. We are all commanded to love one another. And we are all to be relationally generous towards each other. It is something that we are to be steadfastly attentive to, courageous in our pursuit of and persevering in. This is very important. We cannot forget that Jesus in his final instructions to his disciples and to us, and amongst all of that was this, it's by this that all men will know that you are my disciples, that you love one another. Of all the other things that we could reflect that we um, have wholehearted to devotion to Jesus in, And he says it's this one thing, how we treat one another. We cannot live in Christian community successfully without being open-hearted. We can't function as Christ's body together without being open-hearted. Being open-hearted towards one another is central to God's purpose for his church and it is an outward sign of our wholehearted devotion to him. So it's not an optional extra. Number two, at the heart of discipleship is people living open-heartedly towards one another. I want you to imagine for a moment if Paul had closed off his heart to the people of Corinth. He would have lost all possibility of discipling them. And obviously, it's a two-way process, but Paul led with an open heart. And we are all called to make disciples, each one of us. 
And that means walking with someone, being open-hearted, sharing your life, your vulnerabilities, your weakness. And that's what we see Paul doing. Sharing openly with the people of Corinth. Paul didn't try and prove himself or defend his ministry against their accusations. Instead, what he did is he came in his weakness, offering the truth of the gospel, his love for Jesus, and his love for them. He wore his heart on his sleeve. And this is a demonstration of genuine discipleship, and it reveals wholehearted devotion to God. So at the heart of discipleship is people who are living open-heartedly towards one another. And number three, learning to live with our hearts open is part of growing in spiritual maturity. Not one of us here has arrived. If you and I are being honest with ourselves, none of us will be living perfectly open-hearted because we're human. However, growing in this, learning to live with our hearts open and recognising when they're closing up, because that's the other key, is just to recognise, to be paying attention. All of those things are a mark of spiritual maturity in our life. And I'm not naive. You may be listening to this today, whether in the room or online or later on when you catch up on the podcast or the YouTube channel. You may be listening with, with all sorts of painful reasons for why your heart is closed to people. For the very wounded heart, it may not be as simple as making the choice to assert your will and become more open-hearted. But the very good news this morning is that God is the healer and restorer of broken hearts. And he is close to the brokenhearted. At the very beginning of this letter to the Corinthians, Paul says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us all in our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves have been comforted by God. In other words, he was completely reliant upon God to comfort him. We already know that he had had much affliction and rejection Um, for the sake of the gospel in his own life. But what he's saying here is that as he received comfort from the Lord, then he was actually able to extend comfort and get alongside other people with the comfort that he himself had received. Paul didn't simply keep showing up with an open heart under all of the pressure without receiving comfort and restoration from God first. And that's God's invitation to you this morning, to allow him to comfort you, to bind up your broken heart, to allow him to meet you in the midst of those painful places in your own life that have perhaps caused you to close your heart off to people. Brendan, can I ask you to come up? Thank you. The reality is that wherever we are at this morning, we are all dependent upon God. We are meant to come to him with what's bothering us, to allow his peace to guard our hearts and our minds. Because when we do that, when we bring our anxieties to him, when we recognise when our heart is closing up, when we're hurt and feeling that we're beginning to withdraw, or whether we realise that we've actually just got too disconnected, when we come to him and he guards our heart and mind, then it enables us in turn to actually guard our relationships with other people and to keep our hearts open. <clears throat> 
And so for our part, we do need to recognise and pay attention to our anxieties and hurts and to deal with them with the Lord. Otherwise, what tends to happen is we tend to blame other people and we project what is our pain and our, um, our discomfort onto others and then we close our hearts up. We need to receive from God in order to love each other open-heartedly. It is a supernatural thing. We are not just down to our own human abilities and capacities. Praise God. We are actually able to completely rely upon the God. We read in Romans today that he has poured his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Jesus often would say, freely give as you freely received. So in order to keep our hearts open, wide open before the Lord, there is, it's contingent on us coming before the Lord and allowing him to fill us and then to be like a flow rather than a reservoir, to allow that love to flow out, to keep our hearts open. And if that's something that you're struggling with, I would encourage you, seek someone to walk alongside you as you look to heal and grow in this. That might be receiving prayer this morning. It's something that's very important to us here at church, that you've always got the um, ability to receive personal prayer, someone standing with you this morning and praying with you. You may need to make a pastoral appointment and come and see one of us and talk through how this close-heartedness is impacting your life. You might talk to a trusted or close friend. You might need to see a professional counsellor. What I can tell you from my own lived experience is that it's worth doing. It's worth healing and finding freedom so that you can live open-hearted. The answer to the moment that we find ourselves in history is not for God's people to go more inward, to live restricted, narrow, cramped, closed-hearted lives. Instead, what we're called to do is to live wholehearted devotion to God and to widen and make room in our hearts for one another. To live open-hearted lives so that the world may know that we are his. I want to close this morning with the way that Paul closed his letter to the church in Corinth. And this is 2 Corinthians 13. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Aim for restoration Comfort one another. Agree with one another. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.